So we're now going to see our first example of a post-quantum crypto system, and in particular, this we're going to look into code-based cryptography. So codes here don't mean like codes as in secret codes or codes as in implementation, but it means error correcting codes. So this is something which also dates from the 19th and the 20th century, where people were starting to transmit data and trying to figure out how to uh, correct this. So you're having digital data and somebody, well, something happens on the wire and a bit flips. You might know, for instance, this ISBN number. So when you order books or if you're going for journals, then you have a long number where not all the digits are necessary. So the last digit in particular is actually a checksum. So if you have any error in those, like if you copy uh, the ISBN and something goes wrong, then you can, from the last digit, notice whether something has happened and then, well, you don't accidentally get the wrong book, but you will be notified that that book can't be ordered, there's something wrong. Or if you have a computer and you're spending a bit more money on error correcting RAM, so RAM is where the, where the memory of the computer is sitting, so if you um, store data there like you do in a computation, then what ECC RAM means, uh, does, so ECC in this case is error correcting codes, is that they expand this data by not just one extra digit, by eight extra bits. So every 64 bits are stored as 72 bits, and there is some redundancy to check and recover. So that's even able to recover the error. With ISBN numbers, you can just detect that there was an error. In general, with error correcting codes, we do have to add some redundancies. So basically you have k bits of information and you store them in n bits and the n minus k parts are redundancy. Then when you check whether an error occurred, then you check that these redundant bits are compatible, are consistent with the rest of the data. And for that one, we have uh, equations that check whether they work. And since the initial codes were just looking at odd and even, so at the parity, these checks are called parity check equations. So if nothing happened, everything went well, then you're getting zeros for all of those parity checks, and else you can detect or even correct some errors. And if you have a good code, then you can correct many errors. And blowing up storage in this case means you don't want to add too much redundancy, but well, some redundancy is necessary. And when you have such a code, then you get a guarantee of a certain number of errors that you can correct. So that means when you have some code word and at most t errors happen, the decoding algorithm will find the original word that was sent and not go to a different word. It's quite possible that you can correct t plus 1 or even t plus 2 errors or that you can detect more errors, but there are only some guarantees. And the more complicated these codes get, the, well, less sure are we where all the code words are living, but we still get some um, guarantees for these bounds on T. So all I'm going to talk about is linear codes. So linear codes you can describe as a vector space, uh, as a subspace of F2 to the N. And so yeah, I'm only going to look at binary codes as well. And there's some k-dimensional subspace, which we will call the code. There is some view on this code, so we can either determine it with a generating matrix, so you pick uh, some k-dimensional bases and put those into the rows of the matrix G, and then you're getting all your uh, code words by multiplying um, short vectors of length m, so that would be the information part that you want to encode, by G to get code words. So then the um, code is seen as the row space of this generator matrix. And so we always write these matrices in horizontal form, so they are k high, that's a dimension, and n wide. Or you can say you take this as a kernel space of this parity check matrix, so that's similar to what I put on the previous slides, where we have the equations to check, and then code words are those words which satisfy the equations. Well, I said we have n minus k parity bits, so extra bits, so we have n minus k such equations, and then we take in column vector C, multiply by H, and get zero. So that is the definition of the code. So I will stick to saying code word if it's actually an element of the code, whereas if you receive a word, 
that's not necessarily, well, it's not a code word, there's possibly some error vector E, then I'll call it the received word or just a vector. I'll be a little bit liberal about not transposing my elements, so um, you will need to put row vectors or column vectors as suitable, else the, these slides will be much more cluttered. Also, if you realize that you like coding theory, you can still jump in. Um, it's another Mastermind course which just started last week about coding theory, start, uh, taught by Alberto Ravagnani from Eindhoven as well, and there you can learn a lot more about coding theory. For me, it's simply a tool to generate a nice crypto system, and within this short video, we're gonna get to seeing the original code base crypto system. So that's basically how shallow my treatment of coding theory will be. So here's an example of a code given by parity check matrix, and this is a quite famous example, namely a Hemming code, which has um, length n, so each word has n positions and has dimension four. Well, seven minus four is three, so the parity check matrix has um, three rows. And the Hemming code is determined by having that each um, bit pattern of length three appears as one column, except for, well, the zero column, because that wouldn't add any interesting equation. So if you have an error-free string of, of seven bits, so if you have a code word, then it satisfies those three equations. Now, it gets interesting when you find something which doesn't satisfy those three equations. So if you notice um, that the error pattern at the end is not zero, 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 so that the um, equations don't all give zeros. For instance, if you've seen that the first equation fails, the second holds, and the third one fails again. Now, there are different ways that this could happen. For instance, you could have um, some bits collude to, to make this work, but the simplest case or the most likely case is, well, there was exactly one error which caused this. So no errors is the most likely, then one error, then two errors, then three errors, and so on. So we get unique decoding by assuming that one error is more likely than two errors. And then, okay, you now had some time to look at this matrix. So if you're seeing these error patterns and want to know which one possible bit would have flipped the position 0, 1, 2, 3, until 6. And, well, it should be just one of the bits, then yes, this means that B1 has flipped. Okay. I mean, if you wanted two bits, you could also say maybe B4 and B6 have flipped, but that is less likely the case. Now, the failure pattern is simply H times B, so that's how we multiplied it. And for such a small matrix and for just one error, we can just simply scan the columns and, well, the column which finds it is the correct one. I've been writing it here in a format which has an identity matrix on the right, most of the time you would be writing the Hemming code by taking this binary representation and putting the numbers in order so that from the, uh, from the error pattern you can just read off which is the right index. So here's another example for taking the generator matrix. So then any um, length 3 vector times this 3 by 5 matrix will give you a code word. So here's an example where we're taking all three rows, add them together, and that gives this code word C. Now I've been talking about linear codes and I have already said that these are subspaces and then you can either appeal to saying, hey, look, we're not in a linear algebra, or you could say that, well, we can also compute this by hand. So if we take the definition of code words as some M times G, then if you're taking two of those code words together, then there are two M's which gave this, so M1 times G plus M2 times G, and yes, okay, you can just use the distributive laws and you're getting that this is the M1 plus M2 times G. So yes, this is again a code word. Or you look at this with a parity check matrix. So that is where H times C is supposed to be a zero. And now we're doing this with two valid code words. So we use the distributive laws the other way around. We're getting H times C1 plus H times C2, each of which is zero because the H and CIs are code words. And so also C1 plus C2 is a code word. More important words um, that appear in the coding theory context are the Hemming weight and the Hemming distance. Now keep in mind that all my codes are over F2, but these notions, Hemming weight and Hemming distance, 
are defined as integers. So the weight, the hemming weight of a word is the number of non-zero coordinates. So what you see there has a has one zero zero one one. I'm counting the number of ones that's three. So it's not three mod two is one, but it's really counting as integers there. And then similarly, the hemming distance um, is the number of positions where these two words differ. Okay, so the first position is a one in both cases. Then there's a difference because one is one, one is zero. Then they're both um, zero, then there was one, then there was one. So this one just has distance one. And since we're dealing with um, linear codes, the distance is also the same as the weight of the sum of the code words. So we can just add them since that addition is modulo two in each position. Equal positions give zero. And so then we can look at the resulting word, which is zero, one, zero, zero. Zero, uh, and that one has weight one. The minimum distance is now getting to where we want it to be about characterizing a code. So it asks what is the smallest distance or what is the smallest weight of any code word which is non zero. And since, well, it's a linear code, you can add this to any position. So that will also tell you like what is the smallest distance between any two code words. And then when you look into, well, if you're going from one code word to another by adding arrows. So if every two code words have at least distance D, that means if you have gone less than half of the way, so less than D minus one over two, or less than D over two, so let's say D minus one over two, then you're definitely gonna be correcting towards the correct code word. So if you have a minimum distance D code, and let's write D as an odd number, well, assume it's odd, let's write it as 2T plus 1, and then you're guaranteed that if there are no more than T errors, then you're going to get the correct code word. How are you going to get this? That's a totally different story. But you can make a theoretical statement that there is no closer code word. So if you then find an efficient decoding algorithm that can handle T, code, uh, T errors, then you're guaranteed to get the right code word, assuming that no more than T errors happened. And that brings us already to the decoding problem. So this is what is studied in coding theory for nice codes and for, well, general codes. So just take any matrix and see what code it gives you. So take a matrix as a generator matrix and then ask what minimum distance does it have and can we actually decode with this? So if you have a code word C, but you're getting an erroneous vector X, and then, so this is the transmitted or the received word, received vector, this X there, then you're trying to find E or you're trying to find C. I mean, if you find one of those, you can always get the, X, the other one. So if the hemming weight of E is T, so that means that the distance between the hemming distance between C and X is T, then you have a T error correcting problem. And then you might be asking the decoding problem to say find the closest code word, or you might be finding the decisional problem to say is there a closest code word. Now in coding theory we typically want to actually have fast decoding, so there are lots of uh, well, the nice families of codes which have fast decoding algorithms. Um, we're going to look in particular into Gopper codes. Um, but if you take a coding theory course, then you're also going to see the Solomon codes or the Hemming codes that I mentioned in the first slides. Um, and so those are algorithms, uh, these are codes where we have efficient decoding algorithms. So we have a, we know what minimum distance this code has at least. We know how, much, how to correct that many errors. But if you take a random code, then the decoding problem is hard. So there's the NP hardness result saying um, deciding whether X is within T of a valid code word is hard for a general code. And so information set decoding is, well, the best generic attack that we know. We're going to see this in one of the later talks on this. That one takes exponential time. And then the idea is can you turn this into a crypto system? Can you take this difference into well, having efficient decodable codes and having general codes being hard to decode, 
can you turn this into a public key system? Like in RSA, we are assuming or knowing that multiplying two prime numbers is fast, with us factoring a number into their prime, the prime factors for large primes is hard. So Robert McLeese in 1978 had this nice idea to say, hey, look, I know everything about coding theory. Uh, two years ago, public key cryptography came out. Mind you, that Diffie Hellman was just 76, so we're talking really the early days of, of cryptography. And so McLeese then like, well, can I also build something nice out of coding theory? And taking exactly this, this difference between easy code decoding and hard decoding uh, for building his system. And his secret key is exactly a generator matrix of a nice to decode key, uh, nice to decode code. So he picks, um, in that case, he picks a GOPA code, and we're going to see how GOPA codes work. And he designs it so that he knows the dimension, or at least the bound of the dimension, and he knows the minimum distance is at least 2t plus 1. And the parameters he picked for achieving, I think it was 2 to the 60 security he wanted to have, meaning an attacker should take at least 2 to the 60 steps. He picked the length of the code, so how many bits position in each word, it's 1024. And then there would be 524 defining equations so they can correct 50 errors. And what he remembers as a secret key is a generator matrix for this code in a way that he can efficiently decode. Then he also picks two more random matrices. He needs a n by n permutation matrix. So permutation matrix is a matrix which has in each row and each column exactly one, one, and everything else is zero. So when you apply this to a vector, it just permutes the positions. And he also picks a non-singular k by k matrix. Everybody knows the general parameters, so how large these are, but the, the particular code that was picked, so there are many different GOPA codes for a fixed length and dimension and a correction capability. So if you fix n, k, and t, then that still doesn't determine gamma, and it doesn't, well, of course, p and s are also when it is generated. So then the public key is a matrix which looks like G from the format, so it's a K by N matrix. It's again a generator matrix for the same code, except for, well, we have multiplied on the right by P, and we have multiplied on the left by S. That's also D. explains the dimensions of those. So this G prime is an alternative um, generator matrix for the same code. Okay, now we have the secret key, we have the public key, so how do you encrypt and how do you decrypt? Okay, so to encrypt, you take your message, it's a k-bit message, and you're just multiplying it by g-prime. So that takes a k-bit message into an n-bit message. That's the same way as you would be encoding it. And then he picks a random error vector of weight t. So that is a little bit strange in the sense that normally you want to keep your information correct, and here we're adding an error. But this error is hiding the information what m is from anybody who can't decode uh, this g prime. And while g prime is supposed to be random looking, so g prime should fall into this category of hard to decode codes. And only the person who knows how g prime was generated, who knows the p and the s, can then decode and therefore decrypt. So if you're an attacker, if you're Eve, then you're stuck with seeing this Y, the ciphertext. You know it's T positions away from the real thing, but while T being 50, you have 1024 choose 50 different possibilities what this E could be. So a brute force attack is certainly not going to make this sufficiently fast. And well, his paper uh, considered some more uh, powerful attacks than brute force attack, and that's how he ended up with estimating this will take at least 2 to the 60 to break. Actually, this was an underestimate because he was saying, well, let's put some binomial coefficients to 1, so it takes even longer than 2 to the 60. Now, how can Alice, so Alice has made her key herself, and now she has received this message from Bob, how can Alice decrypt this? So Alice wants to use her good matrix G, not the G prime, but she knows that the G prime was just um, S times G times P. 
and so she right multiplies by p inverse. Now let's see what this does on the, on the parts of the ciphertext. So it's linear, so it gets the e, so the error vector times p inverse. Now the error vector has t positions, uh, t non-zero positions, and e times p inverse, well, if p is a permutation matrix, then also p inverse is a permutation matrix, so this e times p inverse is just some permuted uh, version of e. So that again has t errors. Then from the from the g prime, the p inverse cancels the p part, and now I put parentheses different ways. So I'm encaps uh, encapsulating the m times s together. S is a k by k matrix, so m times s is just a different length k vector. So let's take this as an m prime times g plus some other um, e prime which has weight t. And that is exactly what the code is meant to do. So the code now says, hey, this is the t errors on my, co uh, on my code word, the, the e prime there. And so the decoding algorithm, the efficient one that only Alice has, recovers m times s. And when you have m times s, well, s was invertible, it's a k by k matrix, so then you can get m itself. So the views of Alice as a legitimate user and Eve are quite different. Alice has this nice decoding problem because she knows that there's a good G hiding in the G prime, whereas Eve has to deal with the general code. And well, if we get our, our math right, then this um, general code is, is really hard to decode. And so there's a difference complexity difference between what Alice is doing and what Eve is doing.